Welcome, LA Progressive friends, family, readers. Uh, once again, Dick and I are just so fortunate to have Pia Laura Mann uh, <laughs> sitting with us and chatting with us about an, um, an article that he uh, graciously has allowed us to publish. Um, it's in the LA Progressive, and the title of the article is History Doesn't Repeat Itself. Don't be so sure. Peter, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, you know that title plays off the, the statement misattributed to Mark Twain that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Twain never said that. Apparently it dates back to 1987, not, not 1877. But anyway, it's, a, it's in people's heads that history can't repeat. And I'm trying to say here, well, not exactly, but uh, elements of history uh, don't seem to go away in the American experience. I think history is destined to repeat itself if we don't learn it. Um, so it does not repeat itself to the T, not exactly, but it's bound to come back if we don't learn the lessons of history. And I so appreciate this piece for that reason. So so the history you, you say is repeating is what happened uh, right after Reconstruction with when the white elites use various tools uh, to undercut any advances of reconstruction, to, to fight back uh, any, any chance of an interracial society. Uh, tell us about those times. Yeah, uh, in the strictest sense, radical reconstruction, which was really a new founding moment for the United States based on interracial democracy, full participation of everybody, equality for everybody before the law uh, really had about a 10-year run if you started from after the conclusion of the of the hostilities um you know the 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 so-called freedmen's bureau uh didn't really get up and running for a while it was unbelievably successful the educational efforts were unbelievably successful the land grants for a time were flourishing the state houses in the South were representative of the people who lived in the South. That's supposed to be what democracy is about. That was, of course, intolerable to the diehards, uh, the diehard uh, racists. And, uh, you know, they wanted to restore white dominance and they, they stopped at nothing to do that. And regrettably, they had some institutions uh, of the federal government, part of the federal government on their side. Uh, Notably, by the 1870s and into the 1880s, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, disallowed so much of the uh, of the uh, Reconstruction uh, Acts, and then the the uh, betrayal of Andrew Johnson, uh, which was horrendous, uh, and then of course, you know, Grant, uh, you know, Grant went the distance for a while. Uh, he did send in troops all over the place, uh, uh, and the and the radical abolitionists were still hammering away. So, you know, uh, in the Congress, Sumner and uh, Thaddeus Stevens were still pushing, pushing. When they saw this terrorism, these horrendous, I mean, rapes, burnings, unbelievable stuff uh, almost everywhere. Uh, they said, this requires decisive action. And Grant gave them uh, decisive action until finally... It, it began to peter out because the two segments, two sections of the United States, North and South, were uniting over what? Over greed, over over the, you know, uh, uh, railroads and uh, mining and, uh, you know, rebuilding capitalism and all the money to be made and was made in the Gilded Age. That's Unbelievable right. fortunes. That's right. <clears throat> and, and sadly, we're still living with the legacy of the, the decisions that were made back then. You know, as you were speaking, I was thinking of uh, my grandmother, who was born in 1909 in Durham, North Carolina, and how she and her parents, when she was a child, uh, were really forced to leave um, North Carolina because the conditions, uh, you know, shortly after Reconstruction were so difficult for Black people. And so they left and they were part of the, the great migration to come north. But on their way from um, North Carolina to Virginia, they stopped uh, th to New York. They stopped for a little while in Virginia. And um, my grandmother had a little brother 
who I later learned recently, like in the past five years, I later learned through doing ancestry research that he starved to death. He was oh three God. years old. And, oh my God. and my grandmother was pretty close to starvation as well. She lost the ability to walk at five years old. And um, these are stories that I knew about growing up, but I didn't know um, about the, the horrors of post uh, reconstruction. I, I didn't know because my grandmother, a lot of black people just didn't share that information with their children. Well, of course, none of this is taught in the history books for a long, long time. Uh, public schools, even colleges, participated in this falsified history. It was called the Dunning School, named for a professor at, at Columbia, the Dunning School that said, well, in fact, the slave, enslaved people were happy. It's a, it's a war of Northern aggression. Slave, enslaved people were well taken care of. Uh, this is basically uh, a, uh, you know, a Northern uh, intrusion in a settled highly civilized way of life. Uh, and, the, you know, it's in the 20th century, we know this, it's in the 20th century that the daughters of the Confederate Confederacy and groups like that put up all these monuments to the to the uh, Robert E. Lee types, Stonewall Jackson types, they put, you know, stained glass windows in the National Cathedral. This is all part of this reconciliation project of, well, there's nothing to see here. There's nothing to see here. I, uh, in this little short article of mine, I'm I'm trying to particularly wrestle with this question of, so where is corporate power in this? And I make the case that some people would vehemently disagree with that capitalism is very, very content with uh, uh, stifling democracy and stifling free expression. This idea that, that uh, is, again, part of the uh, free market ideation that that uh, capitalism is always on the side of democracy, always on the side of free expression, is demonstrably false. It was certainly false in that era, and I think it's false in this era. You don't find many Fortune 50 or Fortune 500 companies saying, yeah, we would welcome a return of Trump. That doesn't mean that's not the way they feel. That's right. right. C certainly big ag, big oil, those, those groups uh uh you know would absolutely love to get trump back trump is complaining in fact today even today in the in the press today they say why why aren't why isn't corporate america backing me as visibly as they ought to don't they know i'm their guy <laughs> that's right that's right you know i've come to believe that uh capitalism and democracy are um opposites you really cannot have true democracy with capitalism because in the end, and, and here's a perfect example on um, what happened with Citizens United, um, in the end, money wins. And they are the ones that have the strongest voice and that ultimately, ultimately make decisions that are in their best interest and not in the best interest of the people. So this, this, this conversation, again, brings me back to what we like to talk about, the Powell Memo, the famous memo written that... that, that each of the pieces, you know, take over academia, take over local government, uh, media, media, put up uh, various kinds of institution. Each of those pieces was anti-democratic. The idea was to retain the power in the elite. And, and, and what's happening to me is a, a flowering of that that succeeded so marvelously. And now it's over succeeding. Now we're, now we're, it seems like we're on the verge of unraveling our democracy. Right. Uh, Lewis Powell wrote that memorandum in, I believe, 1971. And, and if you if you can think back that far, they were seriously worried about the the power of the anti-war movement, also, but also at that point, the, the emerging power of the environmental movement, gay rights was on the agenda, women's rights was on the agenda. And they had moved, interestingly, the left had moved Richard Nixon, you know, to sign the environmental protection and, and, and stronger labor laws and all that kind of stuff. That, that happened against his instincts because he had to reckon with the political force of what we then called the movement, right? Uh, and really, it's since the middle of the 1970s, I think we could chart this, we could, you know, put it on a, on a you know, newsprint on the wall, uh, 
we, I'll speak for myself, activists like myself, we underestimated their determination and their capacity to take it all back, to take it all back, to take us back to you know raw capitalism. Uh, yes, they uh, they fought affirmative action, then they realized, well, we could live with affirmative action. What we what we can't really live with is economic redistribution. You know, that's that's uh, meaning redistribution in the way of reparation. We can't really do that. But yes, to have a more diverse group of people around the boardroom table, that we can manage that. Right. Um, but the you know the found foundations of democracy, Dick, as you say, you can't have democracy in a civil state without having some degree of economic democracy. People who are who are working three jobs are not exactly going to be showing up, uh, you know, in a line at a schoolhouse, you know, at twelve thirty on a Tuesday to to vote for uh, in a primary election. Not going to happen. Yeah, and not if it's general election, and if it does happen, they will for sure be uninformed partly because they just don't have the time that it takes to understand the issues and know where the the position that the candidates have taken if you're working if if you're working more than 50 hours a week you can't do much more than eat sleep and go to work yeah the other thing i touch on a little bit and uh and again it's not a perfect uh parallel today but it's it's again quite quite close is the deployment of hardcore religion uh, uh, among uh, white people as an identity badge uh, and as a, uh, how to put this, a license to dominate others, even a license to be uh, violent toward uh, others. People forget, you know, that the original Klan uh, those those robes that they wore had crosses on them. That's not, you know, an accident. They were not just standing up for whiteness. They were standing up for, you know, they were they were putting this uh, terrorism in terms of redemption of what's sacred in this country, namely whiteness and Christianity fused together. Uh, and and now with our, you know, uh, lunatic religious fringe, which is not even a fringe, it's gigantic, right? This new apostolic reformation talking about Trump being anointed, the visibility of Christian symbols at uh, January 6th, all that kind of stuff. But they're they're going for it. They're going for it. This is like, uh, well, you know, the final battle. That's their language. You know, yeah, a, another another parallel you draw is to, to the use of the judiciary, which is especially appropriate this week. We're seeing... Uh, what I would call political hacks on the Supreme Court uh, using this this strategy or that strategy, whatever strategy will maintain Trump. But Trump is kind of a symbol of this whole movement to maintain the white supremacy and 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 undercut any any intrusions on well immigrants, black people, equality, fairness, and and that was that had a parallel to what happened undoing reconstruction. And, and if I if I might um, just interject a little bit here on on back to um, white Christian nationalist, I read um, Frederick Douglass's autobiography, which is free. Anybody can download it, read it because uh, it's part of the public domain now. And he talked about when he was enslaved. He said the worst, most brutal, most cruel enslavers were those who touted Christianity as being their driving force. And that's what gave them the legitimate reason to be enslavers. So it's it's right, you know, when you talk about uh, history and not learning your history, you're destined to repeat it. We see the same kind of white Christian nationalists that Frederick Douglass uh, spoke so vehemently against. Right. And by people, the way, people get he didn't speak against Christianity. He spoke against this tight, this strain of white Christian nationalists. Yes, and it must be said that Douglas, also Garrison, uh, and this comes through in this in this wonderful uh, book that I was kind of talking about the the uh, uh, rise and fall of the Second Republic. Second Republic. Uh, Douglas lived a very long life. So did uh, Garrison, and they were and Sumner. Uh, they were uh, outspoken. They saw clearly what was happening 
and she, uh, Manisha Sinha, does a marvelous job of you know bringing forward those quotes and so forth. Also, I, I say at one point, I think everybody knows this, there was a brief time when some of the early suffragists, namely uh, Susan B. Anthony and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, were, you might say, on the wrong side of history because they objected so much to, uh, as Stanton put it, Sambo having the vote, when I don't, I, an educated Boston lady, does not have the vote. Uh, they kind of went off the deep end. But what's forgotten there is that Lucy Stone and many others said to, to Anthony and uh, Stan, you're wrong, you're wrong. You, you know, we, 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 we took a stand for black liberation. We're going to stick with it. We'll get there, you know, but we're not going to, it's not a question of picking favorites. And this is, I think uh, Lucy Stone said, this is the black man's hour to be enfranchised. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, and Dick, if I can go back to this judiciary thing, you know, in an earlier chat with you, I misstated something that's been, it's been giving me a hard time because I can't stand to be inaccurate. It was the, it was in 1886 that the Supreme Court turned, I, earlier it said 1883, that's wrong. They undid the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and 1883 but they didn't un really undo the 14th Amendment until 1886 in this railroad case, uh, Santa Clara County case, where they said, hey, this railroad corporation has all the rights of a citizen under the 14th Amendment. This, of course, is the same time when they're completely removing 14th Amendment protections for black people for whom it was intended. Um, but they did much more than that. They were, you know, they, <laughs> they were consistently uh, bad. And I have to say, in terms of this Supreme Court, how is it that Clarence Thomas can hear this case when Virginia <laughs> Thomas is a, a known insurrectionist? You know, I mean, she was all over that thing. How can he possibly do that? I mean, that's how bad, really, it is. It's it'd be funny if it wasn't, yeah. you know, hor hor horrible, just horrible. So we want the readers of the LA Progressive to know the reason we're having this conversation is because the piece that you wrote and the book that you read, um, you held it up, uh, Peter, um, this book, we wanna recommend that the audience read this book. Um, one of the problems, one of the, in my opinion, the root of the problems that we experience in the United States, we just don't understand history. And like I say, we're destined to repeat it if we don't understand it. Well, there's, and there's another really wonderful thing she does, which is she says that the liber liberatory energies of the Reconstruction movement actually arced through, lasted all the way really into the 1920s to some extent. So did the reaction. But the, you know, the flame never went out uh, and the flame has not gone out in our time, which is why we, we live in hope and we, we lean into hope that people, enough people, understand the stakes here understand that this is not uh we can't treat this as though it's not happening to us there's this odd really really odd detachment which drives me completely berserk among fairly affluent white liberals i'm just going to say it white liberals who are like well it's all gonna it's all gonna work out you know it's all gonna work out joe's gonna you know get some lucky breaks trump's gonna screw up and you know, a happy ending. What if it's not? Can we afford to to be wrong? You know, it's just it it it's 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 just nuts. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I may be knocking on doors in Wisconsin, my home state. Um, uh, uh, you know, trying to stir up some enthusiasm. I was very happy as somebody who worked for the United Auto Workers in a former life. Very happy to see. John Fain land that contract in in at a big contract in North Carolina with a Daimler truck and bus uh, workers, a one a, a an immediate raise of sixteen percent, an overall raise of twenty five percent. That's going to you know other workers at the South are going to say, hey, why am I working for twenty bucks? These guys <laughs> these guys are working for thirty five bucks <laughs> or more. Not to mention pensions and time off and all those things that come with a with a a, a union. The Washington Post is wondering today whether Thane uh, can deliver some of these swing states, crucial swing states for uh, Biden. I don't, nobody can answer that question. Nobody can answer that question. Nobody, nobody knows 
how many union workers will in, in the end say, hey, this guy's our guy and uh, go for him. I don't, I really don't know. And again, the problem is that only 10% of the workforce is union. Yeah. Grand, you know, grand total. Yeah. Well, it's all going to change. It's all yeah. going to change, but it's taking time. This has been absolutely wonderful as always, Peter. And we can't wait for your next installment and our next talk. Absolutely. Peter Lawman, we always learn something new. Thank you so much for um, being such a regular contributor and, all, and always enlightening. Sending you uh, love and lots of hope for the big change we all need. So Peace. long. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.